All right, we are moving into chapter 11, which is all about chi-squared testing. It's the last of our significant tests that we need to run. So we have this chapter, and then we have chapter 3 and 12, which deal with linear regression. So we're going to go through this activity um, in class. So we can skip the first few slides. You'll actually run in a uh, chi-squared test, chi-squared goodness of fit test related to M&Ms. So we can head to page four of the notes and we'll talk about what we are dealing with here. So what is a chi-squared goodness of fit test and what is a one-way table? When we're talking about a chi-squared goodness of fit test, what it does is it organizes and displays categorical data. We're measuring one variable. And what we're looking at is we're looking at the distribution of that variable. For example, when, we're, when we go through the M&M question, we're looking at what is the distribution of colors of the M&Ms? So we're measuring that one variable, in that case, M&M color, and we're looking at what is the percentage of each of those. Another potential example could be something like looking at eye colors in a population and measuring that one variable, eye color, and looking at the percentages that would fall into each of the different eye colors. So a chi-squared goodness of fit test compares an observed distribution to a hypothesized distribution. So when we're writing the null and the alternative hypotheses for chi-squared goodness of fit tests, the easiest way to write them is in sentences and saying something like the stated population distribution is correct or is accurate as your null hypothesis. And your alternative is always a two-sided kind of thought process there and saying that the stated population distribution is not correct or not accurate. So for example, it might say something like in the M&M example, this is the percentage that should be blue, orange, red, green, brown, and so on. And our null hypothesis would be that that stated distribution or those stated percentages are correct. And the alternative would be that that is not correct or that is not accurate, or at least one of those percentages is not correct. So we're thinking always in terms of the entire distribution when we're talking about a chi-squared test. The expected count. So in order to find the expected counts for a chi-squared test, you're going to multiply the stated percentage by the total sample size. One important thing here is to not round those to the whole numbers and to use one to two decimal places. The reason is because expected counts are averages that are assumed to be true in repeated sampling. So for example here, I'm just gonna show you briefly. If this is what's said to be the distribution of M&M &M colors, and I want to find the expected counts. I'm going to take the given percentage, say for red, and multiply it to my sample size, which in this case here was 100, to get the expected number, which in that case obviously would be 13. So in order to find your expected counts, you're taking the percentage and you're multiplying it by whatever your total sample size is for each of the different things. Now, to find the chi-squared test statistic by hand, this formula is on the formula sheet. You take the sum of each of your observed values minus the expected squared divided by the expected. As I said, this formula is on the formula sheet and what it's measuring is how different the observed distribution is to the hypothesized. The closer that chi-squared test statistic is to zero, that means that there's not a lot of difference between what you observed and what you were expected. And again, this formula is on the formula sheet. The chi-squared conditions, okay, similar to what we've been seeing, all of the expected counts are greater than or equal to five. That is a condition for chi-squared. Your degrees of freedom is gonna be equal to the number of categories minus one. The sample size does not matter when we're talking about a chi-squared test. Shown here is the chi-squared distribution. So we've seen several distributions. We know that both the normal distribution is bell-shaped and symmetric, and the t-distribution is bell-shaped and symmetric. The chi-squared distribution is skewed right. The mean of the chi-squared distribution is equal to the degrees of freedom, and the standard deviation is equal to the square root of two times the degrees of freedom. When finding p-values related to chi-squared distributions, there are several ways that you can do it. You can use the formula sheet, but the formula sheet is not gonna give you an exact value, similar to when we use table B. Say you get your chi-squared value given a certain amount of degrees of freedom. So for example, your chi-squared value is 
9.3, degrees of freedom is five. Inside here, you would see, okay, my chi-squared value is very close to here. So this would be the corresponding p-value. It's about 0.10, it's slightly less than that. It's somewhere in between there, but that would get you an approximate p-value. You can also get the p-value by going to stat, oh, sorry, second and vars, and going to chi-squared CDF. Chi-squared, notice here, it looks like X squared because it's the Greek letter chi, which looks like an X. And if you go to chi squared CDF and you plug in the values for the lower, the upper, the degrees of freedom, you can get the p-value. So for example, say our um, chi squared test statistic is 9.3. I would put 9.3 here. Upper bound really big, 9.9999. Degrees of freedom, 5. And notice here we said using the chart, it should be right around 0 0.10, but slightly less. We can see using the calculator, it's 0 0.098. Okay, that's one way. The final way is you can run the test, okay, on the calculator. So in order to run the test on the calculator, you'll be going to stat over to tests, and you'll be running first in this section a chi-squared, looks like GOF, stands for goodness of fit test. And then later we'll be using just a regular chi-squared test for either homogeneity or independence. So let's go through an example here that I've done. Okay, I'm gonna walk you through this one. And then we'll look at several in class after that. So this example says, Liz made a six-sided die in her ceramics class and rolled it 60 times to test if each side was equally likely to show up on top. So our null hypothesis is that each side of the die is equally likely, AKA it's a fair dice. The alternative hypothesis would be that each side of the die is not equally likely, aka it's an unfair dice. If we're asked to find the expected counts, it's pretty easy on this one because we would expect that each side has a one-sixth probability. So if we take that probability, for example, the probability of it writing, uh, rolling a one is one-sixth, we multiply that times the total number, which is 60. One-sixth times 60 is equal to 10. So we would get 10 for each of our expected counts. Here are the observed counts. This is what actually happened when she rolled the die 60 times. So she got a, she got 13 or 1 13 times, a 2 11 times, a 3 6 times, and so on. And here are the expected counts right next to it. In order to find the chi squared test statistic, you're going to take each observed value minus the expected value, square it, and divide it by the expected value. Then you're going to sum all of those up. So we're going to take 13 minus 10 squared divided by 10, plus 11 minus 10 squared divided by 10, and so on and so forth. You'll get a chi-squared value of 3.4 if you do it by hand. You can also do this on the calculator, which I'm gonna show you. You're gonna enter your observed into L1, so these values into L1, you're expected into L2. So let's go ahead and do that. Stat edit, and in L1, I'm gonna enter my observed. So 13, 11, 6, 12, 10, and 8. In L2, I'll enter my expected. Now we're going to run a chi-squared goodness of fit test. So I'm going to go to stat, I'm going to go over to tests, and I'm going to run a chi-squared goodness of fit test, which is letter D. I don't have to change anything here because I put my observed in L1 and my expected in L2. My degrees of freedom is the number of categories here, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, minus one, so it's going to be five. I can hit calculator draw. Draw will show me the curve, which is skewed, right? Calculator will just give me the test statistic and the p-value. There's my test statistic, same thing that I got by hand. There's my p-value, there's my degrees of freedom. This part in here, this 0.9 and 1.1, that is giving me each individual part of the chi-squared test statistic. So for example, if I do three minus 10 squared, that's three squared, which is nine over 10, which is 0.9, that's that part right there. So these values in here give you each of these parts of the chi-squared test statistic. So we're gonna copy down the chi-squared test statistic and the p-value, um, and then we can go from there. If I did it all by hand and they gave me this test statistic of 3.4, if I go to second in VARS and then chi squared CDF and I put in 3.4 and then I can put a huge number because I'm looking for the area above that, degrees of freedom is five, 
hit paste, you'll get that same p-value. So we're copying down the test statistic and the p-value. Notice I get the same thing by the table. If I went to degrees of freedom of five, notice that 3.4 is not on the table. All I would know is that it's greater than 0.25. So p-value is 0.639. Now we're doing the same thing that we saw in all the other chapters here. We're comparing that p-value to a significance level of 0.05. In this case, our p-value is greater than the significance level. So we would fail to reject the null hypothesis. So null, we do not have evidence, or sorry, failing to reject this, which means we do not have evidence of this. So we do not have evidence that each side of the die is not equally likely, or we do not have evidence, like I said here, that the die is unfair. Your conditions when you are checking a goodness of fit test. So we're gonna start in the same state, plan, do, and conclude technique that we've been using. Your hypotheses are going to be written in sentences or in words for these. Then you're gonna check your conditions, three conditions, like usual. First one is the same condition we've seen for all of our significance tests. It's a condition of randomness. Second condition is different. All of your expected counts, these guys, have to be greater than or equal to five. You must, must show the calculations for your expected counts. Following that, is your independence condition, same idea. Only when you're doing random sampling do you check the independence condition. That is that your sample size must be less than 10% of the population size. We will go through this example in class. Last thing for this section of the notes is can you use the calculator like I talked about? Yes, absolutely. I highly encourage that you use the calculator. It's stat over to tests and a chi-squared GOF, GOF, standing for goodness of fit test, which is letter D. You put your observed counts in L1, your expected counts in L2. Do not round the expected counts to whole numbers. Round them to one or two decimal places. You may be asked to do what's called a follow-up analysis. A follow-up analysis um, only do when they ask you to do it, okay? And only provide that extra info. When you're running a follow-up analysis for chi-squared, you wanna discuss which category contributed the most to the chi-squared test statistic, or in other words, which expected count is the furthest from the observed count? Which of these is causing the chi-squared value to be the largest? Which of them is the most kind of um, unrealistic, furthest away from what we'd have expected to have happened? That's what you wanna discuss when you're discussing a follow-up analysis um, in any type of chi-squared question. We'll look at several examples in class. See you then.